Well, friends, it's a privilege and a joy for myself and my wife, Margaret, to be with you here. Uh, can I begin by wishing each and every one a very happy and Christ-blessed 2022? We've come through some difficult years, but the Lord has been with us through it all, and He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. As Reverend McIntyre mentioned, I was actually with you just over a year ago, December 2020, and I spoke in, I suppose, your old sanctuary, and uh, I shared a word of testimony, and I spoke about the ministry the Lord called me to back in 1990. I formed Take Heed Ministries. Uh, if it's of interest, twice a year, I issue a ministry update letter in the middle of the year and in December. And there's a few copies of the December 2020 ministry newsletter in the table in the foyer. Uh, this is what it looks like. It folds over and there's a yellow, yellow insert inside. So if you would like to know what the Lord has had me doing over the past year, well then do please take one of those as you are leaving. I would imagine that probably over the last lot of weeks, there have been many sermons possibly even preached here, focusing on the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure many ministers have turned to passages of the Old Testament, uh, such as various passages in Isaiah and also in Micah, or else they've turned to the early chapters of Matthew and Luke's Gospels to focus upon the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for many, the Advent season doesn't really finish until the 6th of January, so we're still in the eyes of some in the Advent season. And I want to turn our thoughts this morning to a portion of Scripture in the Old Testament, which I think is suitable and applicable to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I have to confess, I've never heard anyone else preach on it along those lines. So if you would turn with me, please, to the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 18. And I want to read from verse 9 uh, and uh, up to verse 15, and then also verse 18. So it's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning to read at verse 9. Uh, the situation is that the children of Israel have been brought out of the land of Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. And God is going to give them some instructions through Moses. And this is what we find in verse 9. God says to them, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect, or upright, sincere, with the Lord thy God." For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. And then God says to the people, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. And then in verse 18, God says to Moses, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Amen. And we pray the Lord's blessing upon his word. Those verses from verse 9 through to verse 14 listed details of people who were already in the promised land but people who were involved in all sorts of basically occultic practices. They believed that through engaging in these practices or uh, consulting with those who practiced them, that they could contact the other world, the spirit world, 
and their hope was that in doing that, they would get hidden power and hidden knowledge. That's what the word occult means. It means hidden. So God is warning his people. There's people involved in all of these sorts of practices wanting to contact the spirit world, but he says to them, you're not to get involved in such practices. And in contrast to these occultic practitioners, God promises that down the line, he is going to send a prophet and the people must listen to him. I don't know if you were at the meeting I spoke at in December of 2020. You may recall that as I shared my testimony, I told of how in 1984, I had gone on holiday to visit my brother in Canada. And whilst there, I had gone down into a bookstore and I bought a few Christian-themed books, even though I wasn't a Christian at the time and hadn't been at church for about 20 years. But I saw a couple of kind of fanciful titles uh, about a particular author's view of how the world would end. And I read them very quickly. And then I bought another book by the same author called The Promise. And I actually showed you this when I was with you in December 2020. Uh, and this was a very different book. This book took portions of the Old Testament scriptures and showed how they pointed forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the foreword of the book, it says this, the basic premise of this book is that it's not only possible that Jesus was Messiah, but that the only fair-minded conclusion that can possibly come from an honest and open investigation of the historical and biblical evidence is that he is indeed Messiah. Uh, and on the back cover of the book, it says, in his most startling bestseller yet, Hal Lindsey demonstrates how the coming of the Messiah was promised throughout the Old Testament and how the scriptures of the New Testament prove that this promised Messiah is Jesus. And in this book, he turns in particular to a chapter and he calls it a prophet like Moses. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 18, which I have just read to you. But he also quotes from John chapter 5. And in that chapter, we read this. This is the Lord. He's in discussion with Pharisees, which was quite common. And he says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. In other words, Moses wrote about Christ. And in the book, the author says this, this statement of Jesus can't be passed off lightly. He said that Moses had written about him. When he spoke those convicting words to his critics, Jesus must have had in mind only one statement of Moses in particular, the one in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 to 19, where Moses predicted the coming of a great prophet, for this is the only clear passage in all of Moses' writings that originated with him that specifically pointed to the Messiah. So these passages in Deuteronomy chapter 18, I believe, firmly point to the coming, to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you remember after the Lord's ascension, there were uh, two downcast disciples making their way to Emmaus. They had thought that with the crucifixion, that that was the end of all of their hopes. And then this person drew alongside of them, and of course they didn't initially recognize who he was, and he listened to them. And then we read in Luke uh, chapter 24 and verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And I'm sure the Lord included Deuteronomy 18 in that Bible class that he gave those downcast disciples. Returning to the verses in Deuteronomy 18, particularly verses 15 and verses 18, uh, I want us to consider three identifying features about this promised prophet that was spoken of. 
The first thing was he would be an Israelite. Secondly, he would be like Moses. And thirdly, he would be a spokesman for God. First of all, an Israelite. Well, believe it or not, Islam claims that this promise in Deuteronomy chapter 18 predicts the coming of Muhammad. Well, time doesn't allow me to refute that ridiculous suggestion. But it's clear that it was going to be an Israelite, one from the tribes of Jacob. And of course, Muhammad was an Ishmaelite. So there is no way that this promise could have referred to Muhammad. Uh, Moses himself, of course, was uh, a Levite. We find back in Exodus chapter 2, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. So that was the birth of Moses. So Moses was himself an Israelite. He was of the tribe of Levi. But in the verses predicting the coming prophet, it doesn't specify which particular tribe this promised prophet was going to come from. But I think we get a good indication back in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 49, uh, we read this in verses 9 and 10. Judah is a lion's whelp, in other words, a cub, a lion cub. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, you're maybe saying, what did that all mean? Well, I'm very grateful for gifted commentators from long ago, one of whom was Matthew Henry. And this is what Matthew Henry said concerning those verses in Genesis. Judah is compared not to a lion rampant, always tearing, always raging, always ranging, but to a lion couchant, in other words, in a lying position, enjoying the satisfaction of his power and success. It should be the royal tribe and the tribe from which Messiah, the prince, should come. The scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh come. That Shiloh should be of this tribe, that promised seed in whom the earth should be blessed, the Savior, he shall come of Judah. Dying Jacob at a great distance saw Christ's day, and it was his comfort and support on his deathbed. So in these verses, it says that the promised uh, prophet is going to come from the brethren of the children of Israel who were assembled before Moses, and it's clear that that Prophecy in Genesis points to the fact that he will come from the tribe of Judah. So, first point, an Israelite. Secondly, this promised prophet is going to be like Moses. So, what features could I direct you to concerning the life of Moses? Well, there could be enough here to keep us till midnight, but uh, I'm only going to give you my selection that I think are relevant. Uh, first of all, uh, as a child, he was saved from a cull uh, of the young baby boys born to the Israelites. Uh, a new pharaoh had arisen who knew not Joseph, and he was concerned about the, the growth in the population of the Israelites in Egypt. And so, first of all, he went to the midwives and said, look, if there's a baby boy born, you've got to kill him. Well, the midwives were having none of that, and uh, so he then said to the parents, it's your responsibility. If a baby boy is born, you have to kill him. Well, we know that the parents of Moses didn't go along with that. And of course, they cast him adrift in the basket uh, in the little ark, and he was rescued from the waters. So as a child, Moses survived a cull of the killing of babies. Then uh, we find that having been taken into the royal palace and growing up there, uh, he went out one day and he saw Israelites being mistreated and he killed an Egyptian. And of course, Pharaoh got to find out about it. And the upshot was that he had to flee the royal palace. He went to the desert of Midian 
And whilst he was there, he had what I would call a commissioning encounter. And that was at the burning bush. You know how God spoke to him at the burning bush. And he reluctantly obeyed and he knew that he was being sent with a message of liberation. He was to tell Pharaoh concerning the children of Israel that God says, let my people go. He was given the ability to perform signs and wonders to validate the message that he was bringing to show that it was a message from God. Uh, Aaron was going to be able to uh, cast a, a pole down. It was going to turn into a serpent and eat up other servants. He instituted a blood sacrifice that was able to protect those sheltering under the blood when it had been applied to the doorposts and lintels of their homes. It was able to protect them from the wrath of God that was being poured out upon the land of Egypt. He was the deliverer of an enslaved people. Uh, they eventually were allowed to leave and of course then Pharaoh had second thoughts and he set off after them and they came to the Red Sea and the, the cause seemed hopeless. And then Moses stood up and he said to the people, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So Moses was the deliverer of an enslaved people. He was also the mediator of a delivered but still sinful people. And of course, the climax of their sin was when they made Aaron uh, shape and format that golden calf that they were going to bow down and worship. Uh, Psalm 106 makes good reference to it. It says this, They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. So Moses was a mediator pleading for the people before God that he would not destroy them. So this promised prophet, he's going to be an Israelite. He's going to be like Moses, and he's going to be a spokesman for God. Uh, following his commissioning at the burning bush, I said that uh, Moses was somewhat uh, hesitant. Uh, he really didn't think that he was up to the task. And uh, we read this in Exodus chapter 4 uh, and verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. So God wasn't going to be defeated by Moses' reluctance. He says, basically, Aaron, your brother, he can speak well. So what I'll do is I'll give you my words, you give them to Aaron, and he will speak them to the people. So uh, Aaron, if you like, was going to be a proxy prophet and in Aaron's eyes, Moses was God because he was getting the words from God to say. But, you know, Moses, he remained a sort of grumpy old man. Uh, he was still saying, I'm, I'm not up to this. Uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 6, uh, and we find this, And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord, speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of all of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? He, he really wasn't that keen 
to, to be a spokesman for God. But yet, this is exactly what God had called him to do. But he had given him help in the form of Aaron. I think there's a good summary of uh, the situation with Moses uh, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the great uh, chapter of faith, the heroes of faith. Uh, And we read this, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. By faith he forsook Egypt. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. So uh, clearly these three points about the promised prophet uh, had much relevance where Moses was concerned. Promised prophet's going to be an Israelite. He's going to have features in common with Moses and he's going to be a spokesman for God. So let's see how these would apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in recent years, uh, there's been a great development in understanding of DNA, uh, about where people came from and all of that sort of thing. And a lot of people have uh, sent off samples to uh, get their DNA analyzed and to find out what their heritage is. Uh, Well, Margaret and I, we did this a few months ago. We swabbed and uh, we sent up to some place in America and the results came back and it made for quite interesting reading. Uh, Where my own DNA is concerned, apparently I am 56.5% Irish, Scottish and Welsh, but I am 43.5% Scandinavian. So if you think I look like a Viking up here, well, that could maybe answer uh, the the reason for that. But then Margaret, her her, uh, DNA uh, analysis was very revealing, in fact, quite worrying. She was found to be 79.5% English. Well, you know how the Irish and the English get on so well and so on. So that might explain the odd time we maybe see things differently. So she's 79.5% English, 12.8% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, and 7.7% Iberian, in other words, Spanish or Portuguese. So that's quite a mix between the two of us. So why am I prattling on? Oh, I should also mention uh, that when Mormonism, uh, where it's concerned, DNA has proved to be very challenging to their religion. Uh, I have a video at home, it's called DNA versus the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon supposedly tells a tale of some family who emigrated from Israel over to the Americas and populated the Americans, uh, the Americas, and supposedly the Native American Indians should be able to trace their heritage back to Israel. Well, DNA analysis of the Native American Indians shows that they have absolutely no connection with people who hail from the land of Israel, but they have a very great connection from people who inhabit outer Mongolia, which would be the very eastern extreme of Russia, probably not too far away from Alaska. And that's the the history of the Native Americans, Indians. They came over from Mongolia and came down into America. So Mormonism has been severely challenged because of the developments of DNA. But anyhow, why am I prattling on about DNA? Well, we're considering uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he is an Israelite. Well, obviously, we don't have any DNA where the Lord is concerned, but we have something much more secure, and that is the fact of the truth of the Word of God. I have a book, one of many in my office, and this one's called The World Jesus Knew. And it says this in chapter two, the record of the birth and childhood of Jesus strongly illustrates his Jewishness. Uh, Whilst, as I say, Moses was a Levite, 
the Lord Jesus Christ was predicted to come from the tribe of Judah. And going again to the book of Hebrews in chapter 7, uh, we find a very clear statement in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14. The writer says, For it is evident that out of that our Lord sprang out of Judah. So as regards the Lord, he was an Israelite. He was from the tribe of Judah. Uh, he was often found in synagogues. And of course, that would be uh, common if you were an Israelite. Again, going to the world Jesus knew, it says, synagogues are mentioned 67 times, and 43 of these occasions are connected with Jesus. So again, that all points to the reality that the Lord was an Israelite. You remember, too, the encounter with the woman at the well? And the Lord clearly stated that he was the promised Messiah. I remember years ago seeing a television program, and somebody said, the Lord never claimed to be the Messiah. And I wrote to them, and I referred to a verse that I'll quote shortly, I never heard back from them. But in John chapter 4, uh, we read this in verse 25. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He clearly identified himself as the promised Messiah. You remember, too, when he was on trial, he was brought before Pontius Pilate. And when Pilate found out that the Lord was a Galilean, he immediately tried to ship him off to Herod to have Herod deal with the legal aspects because he was an Israelite and Pilate didn't want to get involved in that. However, Herod didn't waste too much time in sending him back to Pilate. And so Pilate was returned, uh, had the Lord returned to him, and eventually he sanctioned the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also insisted that something would be nailed onto the top of the cross. And that something said this, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he was challenged by religious leaders, and he said, no, that is staying there. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So the Lord was most certainly an Israelite. Now, what about being like Moses? Well, I listed various features concerning Moses, and I want to see how these are either uh, similar to the Lord or contrasting to the Lord. Well, first of all, uh, by comparison, the Lord, just like Moses, survived a cull of the killing of young boys. Uh, you remember the wise man had been with Herod, and off they went to Bethlehem, and uh, Herod says, well, when you find out more, come back to me. And of course, they didn't. And that enraged Herod. And so he ordered that young Israeli boys up to the age of two should be killed. So like Moses, the Lord Jesus survived a cull of killing baby boys. Moses was forced to flee a palace, but the Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily left the splendor of the palace of heaven. He was in the form of God, but he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Lord left the splendor of the palace of heaven voluntarily, contrasting with Moses, who had to flee the royal palace. The Lord Jesus Christ also had a commissioning encounter. Moses had his at the burning bush, but the Lord's happened at his baptism at the Jordan when the Spirit descended dove-like and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So just like Moses, the Lord had a commissioning encounter. 
by comparison or even contrast, Christ willingly obeyed the one who had commissioned him. Moses was reluctant, but not so with the Lord. In John 5.30, the Lord said, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Just like Moses, whose message was one of liberation, so the Lord had a message of liberation. You remember he went into the synagogue in Nazareth and he read the scroll of Isaiah 61, verse 1, which speaks of deliverance to the captives. And he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He too had a message of deliverance. But of course, the captives that he was talking about were very different from those of Moses. Moses was referring to the people who were, or Isaiah was referring to the people who had been uh, enslaved, if you like, in Egypt. But the Lord's deliverance is for those who are captive to sin and to Satan. Just as Moses had to, if you like, employ signs and wonders to validate his message, so the Lord Jesus Christ, he used miracles to vindicate and validate the message that he was bringing. Uh, I think of uh, one instance where, you remember the four friends brought their friend who was sick of the palsy, and they let him down through the roof, and the Lord said to him, thy sins be forgiven thee. And of course, the religious leaders thought, who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he says, which is easier to say, thy sins are forgiven thee, or rise and walk? And he says, to show that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth, rise and walk. He used a miracle to vindicate the spiritual power that he had to forgive sins. Just as Moses had instituted a blood sacrifice that would turn away the wrath of God, so the Lord Jesus Christ, he offered a blood sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And that is able to propitiate the wrath of God against sinners who are trusting in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, uh, Peter wrote about, we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of of Christ. And in Hebrews, we, it talks about how he himself purged us from our sins and how he had offered, offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and he sat down. His sacrifice, his blood sacrifice, is able to permanently protect those trusting in it. It doesn't have to be perpetuated or repeated or anything of that nature. It's a finished work, and it covers all of our sins and protects us. He too was the deliverer of an enslaved people. If he sets you free, you are free indeed. If you're trusting in Christ alone for salvation, you're freed from the penalty of sin. You're being saved from the power of sin. One day we will all be saved from the presence of sin. He too is the only mediator for the people who have been delivered from Satan's power. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. And he ever lives to make intercession for those who come unto God by him. So he was in many ways like Moses. But Hebrews 3, 3 says this, but this man, that is Christ, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. He was a greater than Moses in so many aspects. So he was an Israelite, he was like Moses, and thirdly, he was a spokesman for God. In John 1 and verse 18, we read this. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. 
And according to Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words, that word declared, it means he has unfolded him in teaching. Uh, John MacArthur commenting on the Greek word for declared, he says, theologians derive the term exegesis or to interpret from this word. John, that is the Apostle John, meant that all that Jesus is and does interprets and explains who God is and what he does. So, in short, Jesus was a spokesman par excellence for God. Never man spake like this. Hebrews 1, the opening verses says, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And at the transfiguration, some of the words at the commissioning of the Lord at his baptism were repeated where God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But God also added, hear ye him. So the one whose incarnation we have just celebrated was the promised prophet of Deuteronomy chapter 18. And there were a number of people on the earth at the time of the Lord who actually recognized that reality. In John 1, 45, we read this, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. And then in John chapter 6, the Lord had performed the miracle of feeding 5,000 plus people, and there was food left over, and it was gathered up in baskets. And we read this, <coughs> then those men, when they had seen the miracle Jesus did, said, <coughs> this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And of course, Peter in Matthew 16 recognized the same reality. He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So this prediction in Deuteronomy 18 of a promised prophet who would be an Israelite, who would be like Moses, and who would be a spokesman for God, it certainly found its fulfillment in the incarnation and subsequent life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what can we learn from this by way of personal application? Well, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge and rejoice in is that God keeps his promises. Uh, even back in Genesis 3, when sin had entered into the world, in verse 15, there was a promise by God of someone who would come and defeat Satan. That was in Genesis 3. And then in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul wrote of when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Now, I hope you'll bear with me as I uh, fancifully speculate on something that's not in the Bible, but it's purely for illustration purposes. And please understand it like that. <clears throat> it's like as if when God created everything, at the beginning, up in heaven, he also created two egg timers. You know what an egg timer is? I, I brought this one with me. I use it quite regularly to make sure that my boiled egg is perfectly done. But there is sand in it, and when you turn it like this, it trickles through. So the idea is that when God created everything, he created two egg timers in heaven, one being bigger than the other. And so the smaller one, the sand is trickling through. And when the last grain of sand came through, that was the first fullness of time. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. But in your mind's eye, you can fancifully speculate that there's a bigger egg timer still in heaven, and the sands are still trickling through. But one day in the future, the last grain of sand will trickle through and there will be a future final fullness of time when the Lord will return and another promise of God will be kept because when the Lord ascended into heaven and the disciples were gazing up, 
angels said to them, Why are you looking up? This same Jesus that has been taken from you will come again in like manner. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is promised, and it will be at that future fullness of time. And of course, we don't know how long or how short that will be. But we do have in our midst people that the Apostle Peter wrote about, people who scoff at the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ will one day return. Peter wrote of scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were. There are billions around the world who do not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will one day return. But we know on the authority of the word of God that he most certainly will return. So we are trusting in that promise of the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should not only be trusting, we should be watchful. We should be watchful people. Uh, Paul, when he was writing to Titus in chapter 2, he said that we should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's said of Horatius Bonner, I don't know how true or otherwise this is, but many people say it's true, that when Horatius Boner was going to bed at night, he would pull the curtains and he would say, maybe tonight, Lord. And when he woke in the morning and he was drawing back the curtains, he would say, maybe today, Lord. Well, friends, maybe it'll be today. I don't know. You don't know. But not only should we be trusting in the promise of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be looking for it. We should be watchful. We should be longing for it. And I believe we should be prayerful people. Because in the penultimate verse of God's word, the Apostle John said, even so, come Lord Jesus. We're living in difficult days. We have entered upon a new year, and uh, there's no obvious sign that it's going to be any easier than the past two years. But we can rely on the promises of God. And just as Christ came forth the first time when the time was right, so he will again come forth when God chooses the moment. But until then, as Christians, we have responsibilities. We have to occupy. We have to stand fast. We are to be his ambassadors. We are to be his witnesses. We are to be salt in a corrupt world. We are to be light in a spiritually dark world. So that is the calling to us for the year 2022, to be faithful followers and witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, as Paul wrote on one other occasion, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Maybe today, Lord. Maybe tonight, Lord. But whatever, may we be found faithful in the year 2022. May God bless his word.